Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, Star Trek goes big. Streaming goes to the max. Our review of Evil Dead Rise and our topic this week revolves around why do we love movies and TV shows about angels and demons? Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow hosts, Troy Heinrichs. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm kind of disappointed you didn't say that Star Trek turned it up to 31. Because I didn't care. Amanda Sink. <laughs> hello, hello. And John Davenport. What the hell just <laughs> Why happened? Why is he at the end? I'm switching it up. I'm switching up because you guys, were, you sounded tired at the beginning. I got to make sure you're paying attention. I got to make sure we're all paying I attention. I do not like being at the back end of this bus, number one. I was going to say, you've got feelings involved now, and that oh was probably God. not a good idea. That that was... Did I it hurt? It did. I did not feel right. I, I, Show I me on earned. the microphone where it hurt. You know what I mean? Right, uh, right about the shaft. Stop. Okay. <laughs> hey, guess what? Next week, we have an interview with PETA, which you can hear completely unedited on Patreon, by the way, along with our latest bad movie night on Twilight Zone, the movie... Uh, oh, and the panel from Evil Dead Rise from the South by Southwest Film Festival. So if you want to support the show and get some banging extra... Con- is banging still like a, a term the kids use no, there, Amanda? No, it's not. No, it's what's a, what's a hip now. slang for great, for awesome. Dope. What's great? It's dope. Dope. The, dope, feels, dope is back. It's slick. Is mm-hmm. it? No, not slick. slick. It's dope. <laughs> slick. That's fire. What's up? All right, we're some dope extra content. Go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. All right. So does anybody watch Love is Blind on Netflix? Because I hear it's really good, but I've never watched it. Yeah, I don't care about the show itself. But the recent live debacle, did you guys hear about that where it was supposed to go live, but it crashed? And so now it released as like a taped event. Yeah, that that was something that I heard about that I was I was actually really surprised. Well, I wasn't surprised it happened on Netflix because the show has people watching it that I would never imagine would watch that sort of thing. I've, I sat, sat down with one of my friends and he told me absolutely everything there was to because his wife makes him watch it with him. And I, he, I know more about that show than I would ever want to. Uh, and I know that there was a fight in their house that night because she probably blamed him for the fact that it wasn't playing on HBO or not HBO, but Netflix. And it it's probably a whole thing but that was a real fail on their part sorry about your friends i hope their divorce goes smooth um <laughs> i mean kudos to netflix for dot, trying dot, dot. to do live i mean that's really the thing but as we know as podcasters like you can do a live episode podcasted right live to youtube live to facebook whatever the number of people that watch the live is very minimal that watch it on demand so really at the end of the day this isn't news this is just Eh. It is news, though. It's only the second live event they've ever done, and it crashed. That's pretty big, I would think. I mean, they're supposed to be, like, the biggest streamer out there. You'd think they'd have that down. Right. They do the they're Chris the Rock special fine. They're the biggest streamer out there. They're not the biggest live out there. That's YouTube. <laughs> That's it's still. I mean, learn how to do technology, man. Do the Just bits. put it on. Just stream it to YouTube live. <laughs> Speaking I mean, of. I, don't, I don't know how IT works, but I would imagine it's hard to replicate that exact scenario to test the servers and see their capability when they there's no way that anyone anticipated how many people were going to be trying to watch that the whole world watches stranger things all freaking day when it drops they should have they should have a base amount of Uh, but that's why it feels like it's it's something weird happened like i'm not gonna they've had so many anonymous got in there or well, something? no, not like that. But like maybe just something bad happened. Maybe like the person who typically manages that like got fired that day or something like. Freaking sh- Steve. It had to be Steve. <laughs> Steve's a dick. He I just I feel like I give them some leeway because it's the only time they've ever made a mistake like that. And it's not like it was the end of the world. We all survived. It just know. laid into the marketing. I mean, it was just a blind event. That's all. A lot of people yeah. were really, really. <laughs> mad about it a lot of people you try so mad. hard to get that joke in there that's that's cute like five people laughing with him right now. yeah yeah about as many people that got to see that live event 
So the end of the Netflix uh, red envelope is upon us on September 29th, 2023. It was announced by Netflix that anyone that still gets that red envelope, that disc in the mail or in the mail, if you will, uh, will no longer be getting it. It's done. My question is, is if I have a disc sent to me earlier that month and I don't return it, does anybody care? (laughs) I don't think so. Well, they'll probably charge you. Test the waters. I'm sure they'll charge you, though. I'm pretty sure that'll be the new analogy instead of if a bear, you know, if a bear shits in the wood and or is it the tree that falls and no one, it's one of those analogies. What? Do you know what analogy you speak of? <laughs> he heard a couple of words and he's like, hmm. the the, tra- the, tr- the tree that, the trare, the trare that shit in the woods. The, I promise was- <laughs> you, you should probably just stop on this one. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> just make like a tree and get out of here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, well, this is cool. Amanda, here you go. Amanda, Amanda, listen. I'm I listening. You, I know you're going to love this. Amazon Prime launched a new feature called Dialogue Boost, which allows users that are, I don't know, for all intents and purposes, not able to hear, <laughs> allows them to increase the volume of dialogue on certain original series and films, which I believe is the first streamer to offer that as an option. And which means that the volume of talking will be louder than everything else. So you can hear them better. You don't have to have subtitles on anymore. I will literally pay $10 a month for this feature. That's how amazing it sounds to me. Because I have such a hard time. I'm hard of hearing where it's like I can't I can't hear what they're saying. I can hear the sound, but I can't make out what they're saying. And I just think about how much more accessible these programs are going to be to people who have even worse deficits in hearing, um, but still have like some capability and how this will help them and impact them. I just think it's really cool. Well, I, I'm really happy for those people who who have actual def- deficits in hearing. But what I think Amanda is actually uh, describing is that HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Netflix have been gaslighting the shit out of us for years and uh they they've been messing with the volume on stuff because i know i'm constantly fighting with the volume oh, okay i gotta raise the volume up here because they're talking and they're sort of whiz- oh now nah, they're yelling at each other i gotta bring it back down again you know uh, i can tell you that uh for the witcher which is not amazon prime i know so before you write me emails i know uh the witcher i i didn't know what was going on for the first few episodes of that show until i turned on sub subtitles same and it has nothing to do with i can't hear what they're saying i just don't know what the words they're saying are because the <laughs> accents are so thick it doesn't make any sort of sense. So, yeah, I mean, mm. uh, Boost, if they can actually put in a feature where they can get rid of any accent that isn't pure American, non, like, non-denominational like non accent. You're so uncultured right now. Right? If I can get a feature like that where I can get Geralt Ger- sounding like uh, some guy from Massachusetts, that'll be great. I think I think he just asked for the English dub version. <laughs> right. No, th- this is a problem, though, I- and I think it has something to do with the same kind of situation we had with uh, Game of Thrones and the darkness feature in the way that the-, the codec gets compressed. It's in that compression that certain sounds that are like pre-produced that like explosions or, you know, trains in the background. We call it the tenant, the tenant effect where there's dialogue happening. Who's because- we? That movie came out two or three years ago. But the whole movie was shot. So like every time they said something important, they were wearing a mask. Or every yeah, time no, they, it's fair. Every it's time the there Nolan was something, effect. Yeah, it was like there there were planes and trains in the background. And the, because the ambient noise is at a whole different recording concept in the way the codec is structured, it's, it's enhancing those volumes and compressing the audio uh, for the speaking voice because the speaking voice only sits at a certain kilohertz range. And I think it's something in the way that the streaming compression differentiates between those two spectrums so for someone to go in and enhance that spoken voice piece of the stream i think is a really brilliant idea because yeah i watch with subtitles on all the time too i just want to point out that um did he just mansplain you (laughs) no no troy says you know it's called the tenant effect and i'm like oh yeah tell me more troy tell me more about the tenant effect i really want to hear this i mean it sounds like the movie but i okay whatever keep on going and then amanda comes in with the movie came out too and i was like you 
tried to tell me that they call something from a movie from two years ago an actual effect and i almost bought it if it wasn't thank you for spotting me amanda thank you you're welcome no that's troy thinking that he can just assign like and he said we too like we refer to it there were a lot of people that came out of that movie and said the same thing which is like why the hell did they actually say important things like how the how the whole thing worked when there was masks on and planes in the background and things exploding. And it just many people mentioned yeah. that as their feedback for that movie. That's why people had to go see it twice. All right. This came out like after our last episode, but we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it. Max is out. It, it will no longer be HBO Max or Discovery Plus. Just Max. Just just Max on May 23rd. If you want ads, $9.99, uh, $9.99 a month or 99.99 a year. If you want ad free, it's fifteen ninety nine a month or one forty nine ninety nine a year. For that, it's only two streams, ten eighty p, and up to thirty offline downloads. And if you want Max Ultimate ad free, it's nineteen ninety nine a month or one ninety nine point nine nine a year. Four streams, four k, and a hundred downloads. Who has opinions on paying for four k now? It's basically the Netflix plan. I don't mind playing for four k because I don't think. There's a lot of TVs and con- um, boxes out there that people have in homes that are 4K. So the 4K streaming, I think, is still something that's worth paying for. And the HD is not worth paying for. HD should be standard at this point in time. Um, I think that the the interesting thing about this announcement, now, there's like two real big things that, that are on top of my mind. One is, is the HBO brand dead? And the HBO brand has a lot of weight. So to get rid of the HBO brand seems stupid. Stupid beyond belief. I think they'll Even still though, have HBO on cable, right? Because there is kill cable. Cable's still a thing. No, cable's not that much thing anymore. It is a thing. Cable's still it's, a thing. It exists. It's dying slowly. Um, sure, but it's there. Can I get HBO by itself as a streaming service without a cable subscription? That's the next question. And like the old HBO Go or something, is that coming back? Probably not because it's all built into this Max program. Um, what I do like is the A in Max has the HBO O as the center point. So you can see the integration of the brand from that perspective. So that's actually recognizable, um, which then leads me to they need to have an advertising campaign when this rolls out that says Max is Mox E because you got the O inside of there. I think that'd be kind of fun. They're not doing that. <laughs> They're not going to do that. No, no. Troy loves to talk about the things that he wants as opposed to what's actually happening. So <laughs> what does everybody think about the actual, what's actually happening instead of the cool ad that Troy just designed that they're going to steal for free. I know. Uh, the other thing I want to know is, is this the fast cert that the, the nine ninety nine tier, is this the fast service that they were talking about where Westworld would be moved to the fast service? Fast is free ad supported. They're, they already moved Westworld. It's on another service. Um, but could they bring it back to ads? Maybe. I don't know if they will. They didn't say, they didn't speak that was, to it. That was the original plan. The original plan was that it was moving to support the new fast service that discovery was going to put out. Now that there's a fast tier in max, is that the service that they were talking about? That's the question I have. No, I they already, seen... cause they already moved it. It's already on a fast service. So okay. it's not for max, but they might bring it back. All right. So how about con- some content? Cause you guys don't seem to care about the pricing too much, but Max will be offering a big bang theory spinoff, a conjuring spinoff, Harry Potter TV series with a 10 year plan and JK Rowling attached. Amanda, you gotta be excited about that. You're a huge Harry Potter nut. Yeah, no, I'm obviously very excited for it. I'm curious to see where they're going to go with it. I trust HBO Max from the standpoint that or Max from the standpoint of what quality they can deliver. But I'll be honest, even like going back to the pricing and and some of the content here, I'm concerned that they don't have they st- there's still no clear direction. Like they keep changing their business plan and their business model and it's getting to the point where it's it's going to affect their loyalty of customers because people aren't going to be able to rely on any consistency. Like we can say that it's only going to be $20 now, but what if HBO Max decides in three months that, hey, this isn't as profitable as we were hoping. We need to increase it, you know, um, for some of the lower tiers or whatever. Like, that's the kind of concern that I have from the business standpoint is 
do they really know what they're doing or trying to do? And can they create like a very clear mapped out plan? Is this finally the plan that's going to work for them? Or are we going to have to pivot, change the damn name again, you know, have all these other things happen? Put it's James just, Gunn in charge of it. <laughs> it's becoming really messy. And, and that perception and that, well, it's not even perception, it's reality. But like us observing that can affect consumer buy-in and... Mm-hmm. I don't know. So that's that's the kind of thing that's like weighing on me right now is I've always had so much trust for the products that they would put out to be quality if they were invested enough in them. But I don't know that even, you know, if I get invested in this Harry Potter show, how long is it even going to really last? Like they could easily say, nah, in a, in a couple of years, we decided we're not going to do that anymore or we're going to go a completely different direction. If not enough people watch it, that's exactly what they'll do. So they keep telling people, oh, we got this 10-year plan. 10 years is great if it's going to go for 10 years. Fantastic Beast was a five-movie plan. That's not going to happen. Three three movies and it's done. They're not going back to it. So it's to, scary. to get invested in, well, it is. I mean, but you're never going to see the end of that series the way that it was intended. Harry Potter could work out. I mean, the movies worked out, sure, but that's a fluke. The fact that that series worked with all the actors attached for that long a period of time is a complete fluke. It's not 100%. normal. I also think the Max name is probably the right choice because when you think about what they're bringing to the service from a discovery perspective, right, with all your home garden uh, I don't care and, about any and food shit. network shows, not, but you don't not want a single one of them. Do I care about? But but those shows you don't want being associated with the HBO brand. Because the HBO brand is high caliber, high quality drama, you know, hard hitting sports, you know, talk shows, you know, um, Bill Maher and um, Jamie Oliver. Like you don't want to dilute the brand Jamie of HBO. Oliver. Yeah, is it Jamie Oliver? Jamie Oliver is a cook. John, John, John Oliver. Oliver is the one you're thinking. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry. Um, you don't want to dilute the HBO brand because the, the because you have those lesser shows. So using the max name bridges the gap from one service to the new service plus it also separates itself out from the other services because everything else is disney plus uh paramount plus netflix is its own thing um but it's like you know everything's like everything's plus espn plus hulu plus everything's plus so max says hey we got something better that it's just plus it's plus size is this but it's even max from the plus size. i think it's lazy personally but you know whatever but it's tied, but it's tied into Cinemax that they owned, right, as part of the HBO group. So sure, I think it's lazy. I don't, you know, going from HBO Go to HBO Max made sense because it was supposed to be an expansion upon the HBO brand to an extent of where they're they're showing DC content. There, you know, and they have a DC channel. They have a Warner Brothers cartoon channel. They have a Criterion Collection channel. They have all these different channels within the service, and that explains Max. But by going, okay, well, now we have all these Discovery shows, and uh, and we're going to change it again, that doesn't make sense when they can just simply keep it as part of the umbrella of HBO Max. Constantly changing it for the sake of changing it is a little overdone at this point with them. Now, uh, as far as the pricing is concerned, I'm okay with the pricing. Some people have 4K TV. Some people don't. Some people have internet that can support having uh, 4K vision. Some people don't have the internet that can support it. So it makes sense to uh, layer the pricing. Harry Potter. I'm excited about this uh, to a couple of different degrees because uh, the reasons and the reasons I'll, I'll list are this. Uh, I want to see Hermione be as scary as Hermione was in the books. And if they do that, that'll be great. I want to see Ginny Weasley have have uh, a lot more agency uh, and not just be, you know, a, a personality less you know, character that doesn't do much of anything, but Ginny Weasley was actually in the books a much better, much more thought out character. Uh, Molly Weasley, I want to see more of from her about, uh, you know, how much of an intense and, and caring character she is because in the book she had more of that. Uh, and then Ron, Ron in the books is not nearly as useless as Ron in the, in the movies is concerned. So there would be, there's that improvement. Uh, there's a character called Peeves that I hope they bring into it because Peeves was a ghost that ran around, um, ran around Hogwarts and he, and he, uh, was the, was the fulcrum for a lot of the changes that happened. So, uh, these are all things that I want to see from the series that I think would be really good. My only fear is that 
if they have a 10 year plan, we're going to get people that either look like they're 12 and then look like they're 22 and like have a drastic feature change, which almost happened with the movies. And I think that's going to be a challenge is like, can we get all 10 things of this filmed where the features of the actors are not going to be drastically different as they move through, or at least only move through whatever it is, the six to seven years they're in the school. So I mean, they made it work once before. I think they could probably make it work again if they, if they did, obviously we're getting an entirely new cast. And so I think that will, Aaron said it earlier. It it was, it was a stroke of, you were right in that you said it was, (laughs) it was almost like a stroke of luck that they were able to have the entire cast connect together for so long and have that franchise be so incredibly successful that having that happen again with the series, that's a pretty big feat for them to, for them to compete with. So I don't know how that'll pan out. And I think that that's where we're going to see whether this show is going to move forward in 10 years or not, or if they're going to scrap it after a couple of years, because we don't have the same buy-in and we have something to compare it to. And that's going to be really tough for them also. And they have to deal with the JK Rowling issue, which is, Oh man. Yeah. The fact that she's attached to it, some people are going to like, and then others, it's very split, are going to say, no, she's not, you know, supportive enough. And I, I mean, she's the creator. Whether you like it or not, she's the creator. If you don't, if you like Harry Potter, she's the one that created it. So I, yeah. I think it's got to be a good thing that she's involved. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like her personally, then you don't like her personally. That's your call. And if you watch it, that's your call. But I'm not going to trash anybody that does. And But they do have to get over that hump. They were asked about it. I mean, so many entertainment sites are trying to make that an issue more than it actually has been an issue. Like, I haven't seen many comments on the internet about it. But if you go listen or you go read some of these entertainment sites, that's all anybody's talking about. I'm like, no, it's not. They're talking about Harry Potter, 10-year plan. That's what I'm seeing. I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking for it. And I wasn't seeing much. So I feel like they're trying to make the issue bigger than the issue is for, for many people. But who knows? Yeah. Or who? I don't know how many of you guys have actually read the Harry Potter books. Did any of you read them all? Or any it of them? Yep. Like John said, he did. Yep. Did you? When you when you read, are, is there stuff in the movies that was not covered by the books? Like, could oh, there yeah. be a benefit? Massive swaths of stuff that were yeah. not covered in, in the movies from the books. That's the those books were huge. The books are super thick, and you can't even cover what's in the movies. Uh, you, you you would have to do a TV series just to cover any of the things that happen in any of those uh, those books. That was actually part of a gripe mm. for a lot of the book lo- lovers who couldn't separate the two where they were like, no, it should be the same story. We're missing a lot of things. What happened here? There are changes made. Is that it was not 100% uniform to the books and there was so much content that ended up getting scrapped because there just wasn't time for it. Yeah, there's there's the aspect of which, uh, you know, there's a bigger aspect of like Neville. Ne- it could have been just as easily Neville Longbottom being this, the, the 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 chosen one as it was Harry. They sort of say this in the movies where it was really up to Voldemort to see who was who it was. And Voldemort just decided it's it's Harry. So it could have been because it was both boys were born, born around the same exact time and the exact same exact place. Uh, and their both their parents were involved with um, the Order of the Phoenix, and it, so it could have been either one of them to become uh, the chosen one, so to speak. There's this whole thing with uh, uh, Gilderoy Lockhart, uh, where he, you can you find out what happened to him, and you find it's there's a kind of a dark story that sticks with him, and along that dark story, it tells more of a deeper story of what actually happened to Neville's parents. So there's a lot. There's okay. definitely a lot. All right, well, speaking of streaming, Paramount Plus is throwing down a gauntlet because Galaxy Quest is getting a new series on the streamer. Section 31, a Paramount Plus movie starring Michelle Yao uh, as Emperor Philippa Georgiou, I guess? Philippa Georgiou. Uh, has been greenlit. So the movie follows Yao as she joins a secret division of Starfleet tasked with protecting the United Federation of Planets and faces the sins of her past and will be helmed by industry vets from that series. Troy, you're a freaking Vulcan. Is this a fantastic news do you care about any of this i've been waiting for a section 31 focused show movie book something for a long time i think section 31 is the most interesting 
mm. unexplored part of Star Trek that this could be either really cool or it could just die miserably because Section 31 is basically like the CIA, NSA, FBI all work together into one organization. They do some pretty shady shit sometimes. Um, they do some really high tech weaponry storage that you don't even know the Federation owns. Um, they're behind, you know, making the cloaking stuff for the defiant and DS nine. And I think that there was, a, this is a really great tie in because this actually makes discovery even that much more prominent in the star Trek universe because of the fact that, uh, in season two, it's basically, um, aligned that, uh, Michelle Yeoh's character, which is actually two people in, in discovery in the first season. She's actually a captain Giorgio in the main universe. And then mm. she's emperor Philip Giorgio in the mirror universe. And it's the emperor that comes and stays in the prime universe, you know, at the end of season one, she ends up actually working for a covert organization within Starfleet in order to help, uh, extradite and save the, the people that are part of the Klingon war that goes on in the early part of the show. And so they, that's basically alluding to section 31 without saying section 31 to star Trek fans. And so to see an actual like confirmation that she was a section 31 agent and what those stories are going to be, or what this one story is going to be since it's a movie, uh, unless it's an anthology, um, then it'll be great. Sounds like a paradigm for virgins. Um, I'm excited that it's a movie because you have a better shot of me watching this. If it's a movie, because I'm done with, series after series after series i'm really really i need a break from all the freaking tv series i would love to watch a star trek movie i'm not going to watch three or four different star trek tv shows so this is a good way to get like casual fans people that like ish star trek back into the star trek universe i would say my fear is is that this becomes the i have to watch the tv show in order to understand the movie problem if they can figure out a way to give enough backstory on philippa's character then I think it'll be okay. But that's my biggest concern right now, rather than just having a whole new cast and doing a section 31 focus thing with all new people. The fact that we're tying it into someone that the discovery fans really, really loved because Michelle Yeoh was fantastic on the show. There's a group of people that probably won't even know what this is about. They're just seeing section 31 and jumping on in. They can do it like serenity. Serenity, serenity had like a five minute intro explained everything that was going on. It's not that hard to do. I think, no offense, a lot of times Star Trek fans think it's impossible because it's so super, super complicated. It's not. They can do it. And if they want people to watch the movie that aren't just Star Trek fans, they're going to have to do it. Yeah, because Giorgio's character is a lot of complex. Okay. And Galaxy Quest, that, that, that's cool. But unfortunately, none of the cast is going to be involved. As of, as of this moment, that could, of course, change. But that seems like a waste. Really, it was a great idea. I love the movie. I think it's like a movie, though, that's like one of those products of its time. It's true. Unless they're coming up with a way to basically make fun of themselves. Well, right? I mean, this is about I, Paramount I don't know, man, because that movie was ahead of its time in many ways. Yes, but it was conquering fandom. That's really what the whole thing was about, was about the obsession of fandom. And it's gotten more so to where fans actually tear their own fandoms down. Like they tear their own properties down now. That's a whole new take on it. If they really wanted to, they could do something different with it and just go after that aspect of fandom and i would be really fascinated by that as a fan but do, they have, but do they have to do that under the galaxy quest moniker could do that yeah. in a thousand different ways galaxy quest has name recognition it's all about brand yep that's it Gets yeah it just more. seems like a real ways to do such a thing without having that cast on there because of course the cast of that movie is what made it work so well tim allen's doing like 16 santa Claus. he ain't got time to be popping over for galaxy quest too he is barely doing the santa claus movie okay <laughs> Also, want to mention this before we move on, just because I think it's it's interesting. But Aziz Ansari, you might remember, was like midway through his directorial debut with a movie called Being Mortal, when the film was completely shelved due, due to Bill Murray's allegedly inappropriate behavior. Well, now he's getting a second shot at a directorial debut with good fortune at Lionsgate, which the storyline is under wraps, but Aziz will star and it will also stars Keanu Reeves and Seth Rogen. So there might be some pot hijinks, but there should be no inappropriate behavior this time well that's a bummer i want inappropriate behavior i want inappropriate bill murray <laughs> mm. apparently he's just an asshole these days so you know he's a grumpy old man it happens i get it all you had to really say was keanu reeves and i was in and then you said seth rogan and i was like i'm still in and so i'm in you know what seth rogan is great at 
What? Nothing. Besides doing pot? Just doing pot and being Seth Rogen. Yep. I love Seth Rogen, and you can't tell me otherwise. You can't convince me not to love him. I'm not going to. Way to keep an open mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does have some talent, okay? He's just the same guy every time. He was great in Fablemans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, he was great in the uh, the remake of the room that that or the the story of the room, whatever that movie was. The disaster artist. Yeah, that's artist. the one. He was long he was, shot. I, I, I like Seth Rogen, but he's it. just Seth Rogen in those things. He is no, 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 for sure. But I, I love, I love what he brings to the table as himself. It's like Jack Black. He's pretty much just Jack Black. Yeah, even when he's Bowser. Mm-hmm. Just Jack Black. Just that's just how he goes. All right, you can find more information at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Join our Facebook group. Uh, we're on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. Our email is feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. And now we're going to move to spoiler for your reviews. And this is our review of Evil Dead Rise with myself and Amanda, plus a snippet from the panel of Evil Dead Rise where a heckler received the Bruce Campbell treatment. You can hear the full Evil Dead Rise panel exclusively on our Patreon channel, which I mentioned earlier. Now, here it is, the review of Evil Dead Rise. Evil Dead Rise tells a twisted tale of two estranged sisters played by Lily Sullivan and Alyssa Sutherland. And these two sisters have a reunion that's cut short by the rise of flesh-possessing demons, thrusting them into a primal battle for survival as they face the most nightmarish version of family imaginable. Directed and written by Lee Cronin... More importantly, no offense, executive producers include Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, the OGs. Mm-hmm. Aaron, we love Evil Dead as a franchise. I do. Yep. You love Evil Dead. You love Sam Raimi. You love Bruce Campbell. Did you have to change your pants? <laughs> no, I didn't have to change my pants, but this continues the franchise's uh, perfect, perfect record as far as I'm concerned. They haven't made a bad film in this franchise, and I'm including the TV show in that. Like, it's it's just all around good. Uh, director Lee Cronin finally takes the franchise out of the cabin in the woods. You know, I'm not counting the show in this. In terms of the features, they're always the cabin in the woods or the medieval times, whatever. But here they're out of it. They're actually going down to Midtown. <laughs> they're, they're in an apartment complex. This family's being evicted. And, of course, somebody... You know, I, I, I agree the circumstances are a little wonky in terms of how they get to the book. But they get to the Book of the Dead. The Necronomicon is there. If people that don't know, that book is basically wrapped in human flesh, written in blood. And if you read from it, you're going to awaken the evil dead who essentially possess you and make all of your loved ones do horrible things to themselves and to you. And there's lots of that, including uh, you're never going to not give your cheese grater some side eye after this movie. So it's... It's a very intense, visceral film. Uh, I liked that they really made it about a family and that they had some kids in here. None of the kids are safe either. Like, nobody's safe. You don't know who's going to lose a limb, or who's going to get mauled, who's going to get just carved up. Who, there's blood everywhere. There's a freaking homage to The Shining. I could have done without that. But I also don't like The Shining. Apparently, Bruce Campbell is hidden somewhere in here. I did not see him, so I got to watch this movie again and again and again until I can find him. And the performances from Melissa Sutherland and Lily Sullivan are what really carry the movie. Um, Ellie's kind of forced to confront her demons early on, so to speak, and I think Sutherland gives possibly the best take on on a deadite since Bruce Campbell got into a pissy match with his own hand. I, I really love her take on that. And uh, Sullivan also has a lot of strong aspects to her performance that really just do wonders in the film. Like those two were so good. They really just, they were, they were here to play and lots of practical effects. Oh, I love the practical effects. And if you oh, do them well God, in a horror movie, awesome. you can also use digital and it blends seamlessly. It's when the over-reliance on digital effects never works. This has a nice blending. Yeah, it was it was so much ridiculous fun. There were so many elements that tie back to the original that remind you of, you know, the specifics. I think there are a couple things that were a little loosey-goosey in terms of plot points, how we got to to certain things. Uh, I really, really enjoyed our lead ladies here, uh, Lily and Alyssa. They knocked it out of the park. 
I will probably never forget her face when she says, Mommy's with the maggots now. Mm. (laughs) Uh, But there were so many really wonderful moments, and I love the way the film wraps up. So I I did enjoy it. Nothing will top the original, but... You know, this was still still a really fun film. Yeah, and all the tones are kind of different with the Evil Dead movies. This is kind of... The last remake was more of the tone of the first Evil Dead, where it was straight horror, grim and dire. This one is really a good vibe of Evil Dead 2, which is a nice horror comedy mix. There's a lot of jokes in here. And, you know, Mommy's with the maggots now. She also has a lot of, like, just humor and how she how she approaches the deadite. So I'm telling you, she's she's great. And her her and Bruce Campbell should do a deadite duo movie, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, hell yeah. I love it. Uh so what do you give it? If ten dollars is the full price of a mission, what do you give Evil Dead Rise? Eight out of ten. Okay, I give it seven fifty. This is a top notch take on Evil Dead. And we're gonna cut to the moment that's probably infamous at this point, but during the Q and A panel for Evil Dead Rise there was a heckler that was, was, some people thought it was uh, rigged or something. It was not. this Like a stunt. Yeah, it was not, it was a, not stunt. a stunt. This man was drunk, passed out. Even before they started the panel, his feet were literally dangling over the edge because he was on like a balcony seating and he was passed out. And they called him out because they were laughing at him before they really started the panel. Like, haha, this drunk dude's just like chilling. And so that's when the theater staff approached him. It was not, this was not an elaborate plan to get Bruce Campbell to yell at on variety. <laughs> the, the man is, the man has a, a wonderful reputation. I don't think he needed no, this. But he also but is one of. Sure as hell. I'm glad he he's did. He's <laughs> one of the, the best. And I was telling Amanda because you, you hadn't seen him in person before, right? Yeah. No, I was so excited and to. I told her before we got there, I'm like, look, there, there's nobody that, um, will chastise his own fans better than Bruce Campbell. Like he just has a way of, he can make fun of you or he can chastise you and he can just own the room. There's just something about him where he knows how to work a room like that. He's very sardonic and and that sort of thing. And this guy, of course, you know, got mad because he was just being asked to leave the theater and he shouted that this movie fucking sucks. And Bruce Campbell shot him down. He's like giving him deuce middle fingers and dual middle fingers and telling him to shut the fuck up. And you're going to hear that. So enjoy this gem because this you're. I'm also going to leave part of it in where you hear how awkward it was. So you know, it wasn't a stunt because the whole Q&A was turning bad. Like it really got uncomfortable. And then Bruce Campbell, like he has done in many of the Evil Dead films, he saved the day. Were they properly prepared for how much intense physical activity was going to be in this production? Fuck no. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> I, I was. I read the script. <laughs> I knew what was coming. Mean, they were sitting around all day just like, you know. No, they worked their ass off. Yeah, they fucking worked their ass off. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I saw 20 pages of Covered in Blood, which ended up being a month, Covered in Blood. <laughs> The most sticky, icky, disgusting. Six month old in the end, because it was COVID, we ran out of blood in New Zealand because they couldn't import it. So that batch that you saw in the elevator that was six months old, they'd be like, Lil, this will do yet by the end of the shoot. So I had like old stanky brew, not like a fine wine. It was, yeah. Yeah, you recycle that shit, it's expensive. You recycle that shit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, nothing can be prepared. I mean, you were prepared, I was not prepared. Okay. Yeah, but I come from the world of fashion where they do like even more fucked up shit to you, so this was not <laughs> really. Um, yeah, we have a union as actors. Yeah. Watch us now. <laughs> I get to clock out. Was, was there anything in the script that you read and you're like, well, surely this is going to get rewritten? Like, they can't, he can't pull this off. We're not going to do this. There's, there's one line which is my favorite line of the movie. Which I know we talked about and you weren't sure and I was like, just do it, it'll be great. And you trusted me and I appreciate that, which is the titty sucking parasites line. <laughs> we, got, we gotta get that on a t-shirt, right? That's her face, that line on a t-shirt. That has to happen. Um, but technically, no, like one of the great things about working with the guys is their wealth of experience making horror movies. And if anything, they were always pushing for more. There was never any sense of, hey, peel back. And I think in making an Evil Dead movie, you have to put it right in fifth gear, like immediately. First to fifth and kind of go. 
So there was nothing we really, there's nothing we really cut out aggressively. I can't remember anyway. The Mar um, we held the elevator scene over Lee's head to try and get the schedule to work. What's that? This movie fucking sucks. Okay, thanks to me and Amanda. Uh, <laughs> any recent film or TV recommendations we haven't already talked about? Have I told you guys about Rebels yet? You said you started it. What yes. are you actually? What are you? What are you actually thinking about it, though? Isn't this so, an old show? It, well, it came out in two thousand fourteen. So it's old. Anything new? <laughs> but it's but it's new now because you did of just the, talk about it literally last week, <laughs> quite but, extensively. But he just started it. So the question is, is is it still good? Just don't for, recap the whole show, man. For, for a guy that God, hated Star Wars now, but he's getting really I'm excited about, hearing about Star Wars. So if you can do it succinctly. I will do it uh, as, with as few words as possible. So as, as Troy pointed out, I was mad at Star Wars for quite a long time. This is not the fewest words possible. John hates Star okay. Wars. <laughs> Admiral Thrawn is now back. John likes Star Wars. <laughs> okay, that's oversimplifying. Thumbs it, up but... or thumbs down. Uh, he wants a, it as simplified as I possible. I want to move past it. We talked about it for 15 minutes last week, and I don't care. I'm being as honest as I can. I love you. I don't care. I don't care. Okay, we can move on. We can go. New. Rebels, Rebels is awesome. New. Everybody should check it out. New. New. Anything new. Um, I didn't. It's not new. If I hear How I Met Your Mother, I swear to Christ, I'm going to stab <laughs> both of you in the dick. He's new. He's, he, he's gonna pull this podcast over <laughs> and start slapping people. It's not new, but it's new to me. I did start watching Letter Kenny, and I find it hysterical. <laughs> to be far, to be far. I, I also find it offensive because they're supposed to be Canadians in the show, and they sound like Wisconsinites, and I just don't like it. <laughs> they are. They are a weird mix. They are. Weird. But uh, yeah, if you're looking for like a Napoleon Dynamite feel, uh, Letter Kenny is definitely in that Napoleon Dynamite humor category. I've been watching a little bit of Beef on Netflix. Have it's you guys intense. heard of that? You've been watching song. it? Very, very angry show. Yeah, for sure. I, I like it, though, uh, so far. I haven't gotten too far in. I'm probably two or three episodes or so, but I am enjoying it so far. Did you hear they Crazy caught a concept. lot of flack? Not necessarily Beef, because David Cho, the actor <laughs> on it, did like a, a rape joke. He says it's a joke. Like in 2014 where he alluded to he did something inappropriate. Now he's saying he never did it. It was just for laughs. And mm. people, of course, want him canceled and the show cans or stuff. Oh, my. They have a beef with the show Beef. Who knew? Interesting. I had not heard that. It's fascinating. But Stephen Young and um, Ali Wong? Yeah, Ali Wong. They are both great in that show. I love her. She's so good. Hey, John, anything new? Um, No. <laughs> Now you've made him a timid cat or a timid mouse. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Sometimes we have to we have to have these these learning moments so that we can move past them and stop repeating ourselves. That's all. It's not John in particular. He it's, just left us. Oh, he he turned his video off. This is where it goes <laughs> south. This is what's going on. You should have been a you were you weren't gentle enough to be fair. To be you fair, you were a little huh? yelly. Was it yelly? It was pretty yelly. You, even even the bars on Squadcast went up to like orange, orange red. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about the same shows every week. 
new stuff or things we haven't talked about. New. That's all. That's all it is. I'm not trying to. I wasn't. Do you have anything new? Barry. You want to talk about? I've been new? watching season four of Barry. Guess what? It just Wait, freaking came out. It how just long has came Barry out. Been out. It like literally a week, Sunday. A it just started. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. that's what we call it. Counts because it's a new, new season. Oh, I. But I think he talks about Barry every time the season <laughs> he, comes out. He does every new season. But he does talk about once it. and new episodes because they're new and it's the final season. And Bill Hader directs every episode. And basically hey, all. Yeah, it is. And I, I, Rebels, every time I sit down and watch it, it's a new thing to me. <laughs> it is. It's fair. That's and fair. It's fine. But and you talked be... about it literally last week for like 10 to 15 minutes. So it's not new. It, That's what I, I, I was saying. I didn't talk about just Rebels. It was all of Star Wars last week. That was a lot of Star Wars. Anyway, this final season of Barry is very, very intense. Bill Hader directed every episode. And this man dire- needs a feature film stat. Absolutely great director. Very talented. Awesome. And I did see Air which is new. So I, I recommend it. Most people aren't going to see it in the theater, but it's going to be on Apple very soon. Watch it, watch it, watch it. It looks at the deal Michael Jordan made for Air Jordan shoes. It sounds like the least interesting premise in, in history, but it was fascinating. And Ben Affleck directs it, Ben Affleck's in it. Matt Damon is the star. Matt Damon should, he's a God to all actors. I swear it's a fabulous movie. Chris Tucker's in it. He's alive. That's good to know. I was looking for proof of life. <laughs> he he finally decided to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> he needs money so he can keep traveling, I guess. I don't know. He's going off saving the world. John, I formally apologize if I made you sad to the point where you had to turn your video off and leave the podcast. I was actually picking my nose. I didn't want you guys to see me do. <laughs> Great. Is I retract it, is it my a, apology. I retract it. He is, it a, wasn't... is it a Ben and Matt movie or is it they're just Ben and Matt doing these different characters and both of them are actually decent? What is a Ben and Matt movie? I mean, like a Ben and Matt movie, like, like like when they were like when they did Goodwill Hunting or when they did um, Dogma. Dogma. Like like if it seems like they're best friends. Like are they best friends in this movie or are they? They're definitely friends in the movie, but they're playing real characters. So I wouldn't call it a Ben and Matt movie. I would call it a Ben Affleck movie with Matt Damon starring in it. Okay. You know, like when they're in um, uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Lemon face, lion face, <laughs> lemon face, lemon face. Apple sauce, bitch. Isn't that? Yeah, that was one. All right. Hey, guess what? You can hear the completely unedited version of the PETA interview on Patreon, as well as our recent Bad Movie Night episodes, panels from South by Southwest, including the full Evil Dead Rise panel and more. If you did, if you wanted to, you can. You go to Patreon. It's available now. It, you get immediate access once you sign up. It's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. Let's go to our From the Outside In topic. <laughs> Angels and demons. Sounds like there's a lot of those on this podcast this week. Yeah, there are. Well, who's the angel? Not you. <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually me. Okay, I'll start. I'll I'll try again. You know what? I've had I've had a long week, day, month, year. It's it's a lot, but uh, that's a I'm song. Gonna, let's yeah. talk about Do the concept tell. of angels <laughs> and demons openly. Angels and demons in film or TV. Do any of you have any issue? With demons or angels, maybe because of religious preferences, or maybe just because you don't believe in them. John, I'll let you go first because, boy, do I feel bad now because people won't let me stop feeling bad. I don't really feel bad because fuck rebels, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, I have probably any sort of relationship that uh, a kid that grew up in a third world country uh, and grew up Catholic would have with angels and demons. There's, uh, you know, uh, and especially being uh, of Latin ish descent uh there's a lot of conversation about around the subject of angel demons and so yeah i've i've got a little bit of background in it i don't have the same sort of belief or background in it anymore but the stories about them uh always catch my attention and fascination was it like because my wife's latina and <laughs> i'm not going to speak to her family or anything but i've heard stories in that environment where it seems very much like, my God, are you trying to terrify children and scare, scare them on the straight and narrow? Is that essentially what you're talking about? Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. There's a, the, you know, it, coming to the States, we find out, I find out these stories that are urban legends here. And, and I'm like, oh, those are adorable. Those are absolutely adorable. They're nothing like what we had to deal we with. We got Chupacabra. And, uh, 
we got the, we got the Kukui and all those other things. And, oh, God, it's uh, La, La Llorona is another one that uh, everyone used to talk about. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the saints themselves had an effect on your life and demons themselves had an effect on your life. And you can light candles and scare the shit out of each other with it. So, yeah, it's a lot. Does it bother me from a religious standpoint? It's, I'm the religion guy, spiritual guy. You're, you're the religion guy. What does what does that mean? You mean like we don't have we're not spiritual? It means he's more he's connected that, with Jesus than you right. are. He's he's the one by, especially to today. <laughs> like he came yeah. over on Easter and he's like, "Hey, what's up with the bunnies?" He did. Yeah. He does go to God's house quite a bit. I do, especially okay. on Easter weekend. Tell him what's, um, up, what's up. The no, it doesn't. I mean, you know, coming from a religious background, it's like ingrained in the culture. You know, angels good, demons bad. Some angels are bad. Some angels became demons. Like it's 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 part of the fabric of you know how you look at spirituality and religion. And I think, you know, there's nothing to be afraid of other than the fact that they do they probably most likely do exist in some form or another. Um so for me it's a matter of I'm just curious about them and how things will play out. Like, can you see them? Do they, you know, if you miss an accident as you're driving down the road because something else got in your way. Was that an angel looking out for you kind of thing? Um, all of it, all of it is just very, very interesting when you think about metaphysical and how it interplays in our lives on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in the stories to an extent. I'm not a religious person. So if it feels like it's coming across to me, like, it's forcing religion in your face or down your throat or something. I'm not really going to buy into it. I'm not going to be invested in whatever I'm watching that has to do with it. But I do really enjoy the the concepts about, you know, essentially it comes down to good and evil, right? Like at the end of the day, that's the angels and demons. And it just has a horror component to it that makes it more entertaining. And in reality, for me, there are things out of like la- kind of what John was talking about, how Latin um cultures believe in these different creatures and monsters or demons, whatever you want to refer to them as. Um, And that's what is like, makes it more scary to me is when I think about the reality of like the potential for that versus, I don't know, watching something like dogma (laughs) and having that or even Lucifer, like using that as an example, because it's more recent. He makes the devil seem cool. Like he makes me want to join. He does. He really does. He does. But like when I think about El Chuc, chupacabra like that is a beast that could potentially be out in our area you know what i mean like essentially like a sasquatch or something and to me that is that is more creepy than this being that's living in another world that i can't really connect to unless i die or i'm in some like you know limbo stage and so to me that's what's more scary than the concept of these floating angels and demons. Well, that's the, that's the basis of most of these stories, isn't it? That these, these creatures that are supposed to be other dimensional and, or, and, or living in a different state in which we live in occasionally cross over into our, the the state that we live in to affect our lives in either good or bad ways or Mm -hmm. with good intentions, but end up looking terrifying. Like that's the, that's the part of it is that, you know, the, what if of it all that catches your attention and catches your imagination and and, and carries forth this, this air of what's possible. Um, But again, like uh, it's something that I, I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to anymore, but the stories will always fascinate me. Does anyone else feel more connected to, and sorry to kind of derail and ask my own question, but I feel like I'm more connected to the concept of demons, like possession terrifies me. The concept that that has or could have happened is just, it's really creepy to me. And that anytime I watch something with possession, I enjoy it, but it's because I'm getting scared on some level. Um, It's something that creeps me out. Whereas like with angels, I don't just sit around thinking that I have an angel on my shoulder or someone watching over me in that capacity. I am more connected to, and this sounds really dark and sad, but like the, the demonic side of it where I'm like, that feels more plausible. That feels more realistic or I can buy into that idea more than I can the good, even though like logically they're supposed to be the same. Like I'm supposed to buy into them equally based on the the concepts and stories. 
I mean, there's, that there's, there's, there's a lot that, be, that can be un- unpacked with that where, you know, it's your your own your own personal state of mind. But also there's a there's a tangibility that's always expressed when you see a, a possession happen. And when you see the the effects that go on under the body of what these people are going through while they're being possessed, the, all of that has a like a, a tangible feel to it that you can you and helps you anchor and set aside your suspension of disbelief. Whereas you have this angel sitting on your shoulder and he's looking out for you. Well, the motherfucker is drunk and tired, if that's the case. Okay? So uh, he's not looking out for me. He doesn't give a shit. And uh, it's easier for me to believe that my body's being take o- taken over by a demon. So, yeah, I get it. Sorry, I got a little... Uh, no, 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 no. Angry? I, I don't uh, understand the whole... Look, I don't buy into it. I think it's nonsense, personally. So it doesn't scare me. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in demons. I don't believe in angels. It's just me. I just don't. Maybe I'm too stubborn. Maybe I'm too cynical. Whatever the reason is, I don't believe in it. So I do like those movies, though, and I don't know why, because I usually the things that scare me in movies are things that I genuinely am afraid. That's probably why I like slasher movies so much and why they actually have some kind of effect on me is because I'm like, that could happen. Strangers, that movie, that could happen. Why Why did you come after us? Because you're home. Shit, I can't be home ever. You know, that's kind of thing. Like, that would terrify me. Demons, I, The Exorcist, it's my mother's favorite horror movie. It's never scared me. I laughed at, her the, laughed at it, <laughs> and at the first time I watched it, she was so mad at me, she didn't want to watch it with all the way to the end, because I was making fun of it. It's just not something that, that I think terrifies me, because I don't inherently believe that even if there is a God, even if there is a higher power, I just don't believe there's demons and angels roaming around. Like, there's enough people doing horrible shit, and it's just a, an excuse to blame it on something else rather than taking personal responsibility. That's the way I look at them. So I just have a hard time with demons and films in general. I like them when they're fun. I like Al Pacino and, and The Devil's Advocate. You like Little Nicky? Okay, I don't like Little Nicky. <laughs> Take that I love one. Little Nicky. Wow. That was an Adam Sandler movie that you did not love. It's the only one I do not like. I do not like that movie. It's pretty it's, bad. It's pretty awful. Yep. It's pretty awful. The Popeye's chicken is the shit. God. <laughs> anyway, so I don't like that one. I've really, really tried though, man. I watch all of them and Evil Dead got me. The first time I saw the original Evil Dead, I was terrified by it, but I... I I think it's probably important to note that at my mother's side of my of her family, not my mother, but her brothers and my grandfather, were all Baptist preachers. So I was surrounded by religion for a, a good portion of my life. So I think it probably affected me more then because I was more terrified of those things, where the older I got, the less I believed in those things. Not that I'm an atheist, because I'm not, but I don't believe in demons and angels. And You're more agnostic. What, yeah, I'm more like, it's... Uh, that noise was because you didn't oil the closet. That's really what it was, you know? Didn't oil the closet. Yeah, something like that. Your kid's acting out because your kid's a shithead, because you didn't parent very well, because you keep giving them a tablet. There's a lot of reasons why these things happen. It's not just, I just think people love to blame on something else as opposed to just taking the responsibility. Now, when it, if a kid's head actually does spin all the way around, I will retract everything I just said, but I have to see it personally. Yeah. And I think we use this stuff to explain, I mean, it's like, you know, like early Polynesians, right? When they're looking at volcanoes in Hawaii and how they just, and we experience this looking at the volcano from the cruise ship as we're coming around on the big island at night. And just, you can see how it looks like there's the earth is breathing and just this anger and soot and fire. And at night it looks even scarier. And you can see how you just have to come up with some kind of explanation for what that is because you don't know what it is when you're in those early cultures. So when you don't know what something is, I, I had terrible nightmares when I was three and four years old. And I would swear it was like a bearded guy with fangs that would actually like try to eat me while I was sleeping. And I would see him on the wall above my head. I had like a slanted ceiling. Oh, that was and, Santa. And then my, <laughs> and my mom would come in and she would use like a Windex bottle. And I always thought the Windex bottle was the monster killer because then she would spray the, the wall and then wipe it down. It was just water in the Windex <laughs> bottle. I found out That's later. You know, but like that it made, demon. Oh, he's so streak free. I know, but I mean, it, it's those kind of things where you just you feel safe because your parents are doing that kind of thing. Now, uh, if you let him sleep in your bed because he's afraid of the room or she's afraid of the room, you know that's a different story. Like you gotta, 
you know, that's developing bad habits and bad patterns. But at the end of the day, I, I definitely think that there are things that are unexplainable and we just look to religion when you're growing up in religion or you look to other things if you grow up in other things, aliens or what have you. Mm. Had to be aliens. All right. So, Amanda, why do you think people that do not even have a belief in God or religion still enjoy films with angels and demons? Any any theories in this? Oh, what a perfect question for the perfect person. Um, I think it just goes back to perfect. that core yin and yang, good and evil. It's it's something that we see in the world in terms like we can connect sometimes some of the people we've been friends with or dated or our family members were like, maybe you are a possessed demon because you are acting a fool right now. Those like we can identify people who are really bad with those demons and people who are really good with those angels. And I think a part of us also, even if we don't believe, wants there to be some positive, meaningful outcome from us going through really shitty circumstances or something. And angels provide that for us, right? The demons also, like the demon side of it helps to try to reinforce what things you should and shouldn't do and what will happen you know, things that could happen to you if you're not good, like some of those really old traditional ways of thinking when it comes to religion and angels and demons. Mm -hmm. Some people still, you know, because it's so common in America, right, in the West, it's it's just a common notion. So it's almost part of our culture and society for that to be norm. And for those of us who don't believe in religion, it's still – it's still something that we see and observe and experience that's part of our life experience, even if we don't buy into it, if that makes sense. No, it does. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's many that believe in some form of spirituality, whether it be world religions or paganism or the occult or Wiccan. I think many can get behind the concept of spiritual beings like alien, angels and demons. So, I mean, there's even a whole damn book called angels and demons from Dan Brown and later turned into a movie. So um, I just think that, it, it, it's easy to enjoy these films because even if you don't believe in God or Satan or something of that Allah, you know, related in that, in that field that there's still enough spirituality things that people can get behind this concept of there's good and there's bad. Isn't that angel and demons book and movie about puzzles and yeah. not have anything to do with angels or demons, but it's all tied into the, church and the in the history and the art and the spirituality and the, the it's all the puzzles around all of the upbringing of the past okay it's like national treasure there's no actual treasure and it's not often i understand john but i think i got him yeah just kidding Dip. all right cool <laughs> i think i get what his point was isn't it for the vast majority of film like entertainment watchers doesn't it seem like Angels and demons are treated more as though they are fictional characters than actual religious icons in many respects. Looks up Good Omens. They were actual religious icons. Those those names are like huge in the way that they did the Good Omens TV show. If you have any kind of biblical history knowledge at all, I mean, I was just cracking myself up watching that stuff because it was like, oh, yeah, there's the angel that stands in front of the Garden of Eden with the flaming sword and he loses the flaming sword. Like That shit's funny. The, the reason why unicorns don't exist because there were two by two going onto the ark and the one unicorn runs away. That shit's funny because you're in, uh, in, ingrained in those stories and then you're seeing it play out with people that are named angels that you actually identify with and a demon that you identify with. I, I think that kind of storytelling is great because there's a lot of people that believe in that stuff um, dwindling as the years go along, but there's still a good base of people that would buy into a, a story about that because they can connect and understand who those demons and angels are and why those stories exist. Are there any representations of either one that just frustrates you as in this is a silly way to present an angel or demon, John? I don't like when they walk around looking like everybody else. That makes me crazy. You got to have wings or what? You got to have wings, maybe a pelt, you know, horns, any of those things. Uh, but when they when they're walking around looking like everybody else, that drives me nuts. If just to me as someone who wants to be visually enticed into watching something, um, 
it feels cheap when movies and television do that. And uh, I feel like they should be expanding their budget, expanding what they're doing. I want to see, I want to see more. Tell me more or or show me visually more. I think I'm good on tree rape. I feel like I (laughs) saw that in evil dead and I just never Mm -hmm. need to see that again. As much as it (laughs) kind of terrorized me as a kid, it's just weird. It's dumb as hell. And it's just weird. Yeah. It gets weirder too. Like, the more time that passes mm-hmm. and I reflect and I rewatch and I'm like, this, this is something. All this right. was a choice. Somebody sat around and said, all right. Yeah. We got these demons, right? These demon winds, if you will. They're coming at you and um, they're going to grab the vines and they're going to do things to this lady that are inappropriate. Why? Because. Okay. Just because. Yep. Just, Just because, because they can. It's very weird. Very weird. Okay, so what are your favorite representations of angels, angels and demons? Like, right off the top of my head, I could tell you Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life is right at the top of my my list because I love that movie and it's such a meaningful film and it was it's nice even though he's walking around like everybody else, John. I'm sorry, but I really dig Clarence. The first one for me is going to be Dogma. That's just it's such yeah, a Bartleby fun Bartleby and Loki. One. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, there's it, we don't really need to say too much about it. If you haven't seen Dogma, go watch it. No, let's talk great. about the ship monster for a while. Like, is that an angel or is that a demon? I don't know what That's that a is. demon. Is it? The, Are we sure, the Golgothan, the Golgothan is, a shit, uh, is a shit demon. They literally say the words shit demon. Yeah, but it's, I don't know. It, it felt like maybe it's misbranded. <laughs> maybe he's trying to rise above, you know, trying to do better. I, mean, I just love how they took it out with that, that, that air freshener spray. <laughs> I mean, we already mentioned good omens. I love good omens. And I, um, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm opposite of John. I hate when it's depicted as the scary redheaded, pointy tail wings or whatever, like Tim stero- Curry, yeah, stereotype Marching kind of thing. And um, I prefer the special, secretive, like just dressed up as a human, like in Field of Dreams, right? Those are angels at the end of the day. That's a but, good one. Oh, I was like, those aren't demons. That's a father son movie. You son of a bitch. You're right, <laughs> angels. Forgot about those. <laughs> Uh, one of my favorites is Christopher Walken's Gabriel from Prophecy. Oh my god, uh, it was so wild! It was so crazy. And you know, sometimes he's got something that seems like wings. Sometimes he doesn't. But his 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 portrayal of that character of uh, of Gabriel was so amazing. The whole the whole way he would talk to people, the fact that he's an angel and he is one of the more terrifying things on the screen. Vigo Mortensen shows up as the devil, and yet he's nowhere near as scary as Christopher Walken. That's a lot. So good. They made like fourteen of those damn things. I felt like they just kept cranking I, I, them out. I watched the first three and I was done. I think you can you could be done after the first one, really, if you choose to. You could. I wasn't, but you could be. <laughs> uh, Fallen Azazel. How about that? Yes, that that's nice, right? that's that's a really good that's a really good depiction of a demon for sure. I like that one a lot. Oh, the unseen, right? That's the worst, and then takes possession. And that one kind of scared me, even though I I have no fear of being possessed in any way, shape, or form. But that one really did scare me in many ways. One of my favorite ones that's come out from the last handful of years and would be in my top for all time would be The Good Place. I think how they wrote that, how they depicted the characters, the angels and the demons, and how that entire story transformed was just brilliant like truly brilliant until the very last scene i'm surprised you didn't mention anything from buffy i figured buffy would be the first place she went good place is good don't get me wrong i'm just well like, i didn't want to get yelled at from grumpy pants over here who says i'm talking about the same things too much yeah he's gonna get me in a second so that's right. <laughs> true statement why is uh-huh. how i met your mother got a demon in it for fuck's sake <laughs> no supernatural no. Nope, but this is something I have mentioned. Or so there is supernatural, but I was saving that for you know to see what's going to happen. I, <laughs> one of my favorites is, and it's very recent. Which is, it comes from the show Evil, because the way a good Evil show that's a really it is a really good show. show. Really good. So it, it it really is good. It really is underrated. I really love how they're taking how they take the whole story of of what they're doing because that that's more about um, it's like X Files with real nuns. 
Yeah, it's well, it's, it's that, but also everyone you're dealing with is a uh, unreliable narrator. So sure. there's yeah. there's there's also that. But you've got you've got the way they depict demons, and, you, and they go with like full costume, practical effects on people. To then there's the people who are walking around looking like everybody else. And if it wasn't for the fact that it's Michael Emerson and he looks terrifying already, uh, it would it wouldn't be nearly as scary as it is. Um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of that show, but they. They do so many great things when with angels and demons that it just looks great. Uh, angels are something that I I've always had a feeling that if they were real, you wouldn't want to run into them in a dark corner. And that show really depicts that pretty yeah, strongly. That's true. Yeah, everybody's terrified of angels. There's there's supposed to be like Clarence, man. They help you out when you're having a down day. Since when? I don't know. That's what it says in the the great book. Of it's a wonderful Since life when <laughs> description. I mean, knock, we at should... the, knock at the cabin. Knock at the cabin. Yeah, with the representation of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh yeah, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. But they weren't scary until they started slashing the shit out of everybody. I would argue they ways. weren't scary, and then just that would probably stop there. They just weren't. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron mentioned how cool Lucifer made oh angels and demons seem tom ellis recruit me but i will holy join help like the the entire family and there's i i don't want to spoil anything in case people are still kind of like working on it um because i know that it just wrapped up not that long ago but there's some really cool moments where they have mass amounts of angels and demons and like fights and all that stuff and it's just incredible and i think they give so much human trait and characteristic to them which i think is what troy is looking for he's looking to be able to like connect with them he's looking for them to resemble him and the people that he sees in the world and for that to be you know that's that's more positive for us to you know we're less scared that's we have problems with ufos and aliens because people are scared of them because of what we've depicted them as and so if you take that scary component away and you make them hella cool like people you would want to hang out with on the weekend like they do in lucifer it makes that buy-in a lot more fun i'm telling you right now i would i would be seduced to the dark side pretty quick because he's that cool it wouldn't take he's, much no, he's for cool. anybody and that bar's cool i would just want to hang out there it's like your soul like and you're going to do our bidding. All right. Easy sales pitch. Uh, I, I would I add uh, George Burns and Oh God, You Devil. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that that's pretty good. I like that. So good. He's a good God. He's a good devil. I just love George Burns in those. Uh, Peter Stormare and Constantine is a personal favorite. Mm-hmm. Even though he's literally the same guy in everything, really. He I, I think he might just be the actual representation of the devil. He's very he, good. He might be. And actually, well, you know, the same movie, Constantine. Like, that's where Gabriel is terrifying. Like, right? Yeah, you have a, you have a um, Tilda Swinton as Gabriel, Swinton. and she is and she is pretty terrifying. And some of the imagery they're using for like uh, the guy from um, Bush, he's also a demon, also kind of terrifying. Um, but he he pulls off that I'm so cool, you want to hang out with me look. But Peter Stormare, that's the one time he is somebody completely different. Um, to me at least, because the way he portrays the devil, he is, he actually looks like in most of his other roles, he, I, I, I'm pretty sure he just hit a meth pipe, uh, before he nine millimeter and Constantine. If you watch him back to back, I think he was auditioning the same day. Right. Right. (laughs) Same character. He played the devil in nine millimeter. All right. Is it nine millimeter? Eight millimeter. Sorry. Eight Eight millimeter. millimeter. Right. Okay. I stand corrected. I back (laughs) off now. No, you're, I don't think you're wrong. I just mean like those two characters are very similar. How he plays them, they're very, very similar. I mean, oh yeah, but he's he's never as animated as he is in, in in as as the devil. Yeah, I mean, I bleep and hate this because I'm terrified as shit. But that must make it a favorite representation because it terrifies me to shit to this day. What's that? Um, but Poltergeist and the giant throat monster in the closet towards the end of the movie. Mm. Like freaking love ooh, that movie. Say that slower next time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to this day, I, I, if there is a light on behind a door, <laughs> if there is a light on behind the door, I will not go down the hallway. I will not approach the door. I won't go anywhere near the door. And my I'll wonderful, wonderful daughter does this all the time where she'll close my office door and then turn the light on. And then I have to come up here to podcast or something. And I can't get in my office until someone goes and opens the door for me. 
Are you serious? That's like a genuine fear of yours? Genuine fear. I'm not. No. No. I would totally screw I also, you every day. I also watch yeah. Poltergeist when I was like, day. I was like eight. So it's like. Troy, I don't want to hear nothing because I re-rented that from Blockbuster when I was like seven years old for like, I don't know, a good few months minimum. Yeah. Well, no. late you just, you just need some tougher skin. No. You got to know really that you can Carol fight Ann. them. Nope. That movie in Exorcist, I saw way too young. Those movies freaked me out. I don't get Exorcist. It's so ridiculously over the top. Like, you watch what it, is I mean, scary about that? You watch it when you're a teenager. It is totally over the top. You watch I watched it when, it when I was nine years old. It I was, was six. Not, I was it six. It did not do anything to me. I laughed through it. But I also, I mean, you know, she's like, you know, it's kind of I think it's the, the body, the body positions is what's really creepy. The fact that it's a kid and you're a kid watching yeah. a kid. That was the... And that was the lock-in effect. The only time that ever affected me at all is when they was it re-release, right? Where they did the spider walk. Yeah. Yeah. That was walk, re-release. Well, it was much better it because the you know special effects are better. Yeah, that was creepy. Like that that part uh, that was genuinely creepy. It was still ridiculous, but at least it was creepy. Is it a spider walk or a crab walk? Crab walk. Crab walk. Okay. Jeez. I must have, I must be thinking of the spider walk in nine millimeter <laughs> movie that doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> Uh, Cenobites and Hellraiser, I mentioned those, and the Deadites and Evil, the Evil Dead movies, of course. And actually, you know, we talked about the Evil Dead in our uh, review. I gotta say, if you if you're debating, if you're on the fence, you don't know, man. They really do some cool things with Deadites in this one, in in terms of the possessions and whatnot. So it's definitely worth it to check that one out. Okay, well, share your thoughts in this episode or, or anything else in our Facebook group or on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. You can rate and subscribe on your preferred podcast app. I just want to apologize for yelling at John earlier. I, I'm sorry. It's been a it's been a bad day. Apparently, it was very offensive, and I do legitimately mostly you yelled apologize. At me? I want to point out he yelled at me too, probably worse, and he hasn't apologized to me. What did I yell at you about? Because I was trying to make a joke, and you were you, like, you "I'm were talking, talking all over me." When I was I had that big you went bitch in for intro. two minutes, I was like, "Come on, Aaron, break it up. You're pulling an Amanda." Fair enough. I'm sorry, Amanda. I want to apologize <laughs> to you as well. <laughs> Troy, do you want any apology from Aaron I'm for just, anything? I'm just, I'm just really upset that I'm not I'm the only one that never got an apology today. <laughs> you did, I didn't yell at you yet. But you but, were also but, top but I, of the list. But I was left out. <laughs> I didn't you get were an first. My feelings are hurt. Okay. Well, it's, it's, I apologize for having one of those days. You know what? Let's just pretend like this representation <laughs> of me was my chat GPT. It wasn't actually Aaron present. It was the demon version of Aaron. That's right. There's an angel version and a demon version. I don't know if the angel version ever shows his face, but plus I had I had computer issues, and that just makes me more frustrated. On the cruise, your angel version comes out. That's right. Mostly. With alcohol yeah, comes his that's... angel version. He is truly one of the nicest. Like, some people turn into really mean people when they drink, and others turn into genuine angels and just so sweet. And, and he that's the way Aaron gets. He's so kind and gentle. And that's why most people think I, they, I should drink more. <laughs> Probably. If you could... Uh, do like three shots before you come over tonight. That'd be great. Just just show up lit. Just loosen up a bit. That's right. All right. Uh, we're going to play a game, How Do You Survive? Evil Dead Edition, in honor of that classic film. Coming back for another go-round. Here we go. We give you a scenario, and you guys have to tell us, how do you survive? You guys ready? Ready, ready. ready. Okay. Now, here's the order. Troy, John, me, Amanda. Ready? Ready. Here's a scenario. You and some friends vacation at a lovely cabin in the woods when you stumble across a delightful book bound in human flesh whose incantations are read aloud by your idiot friend and now the dead are coming to live you need to find a way to avoid the demons coming your way until daylight you have a cellar a closet a shed with lots of power tools or the infinite woods to attempt to navigate and you have to choose if you allow your bestie to come with you or leave them in the dust knowing they might be possessed how do you survive troy i don't have there's no like it could be any kind of power tools mm-hmm. or the infinite woods and a cellar well the number one thing is that i definitely do not let my bestie live right bestie so straight up murder them before you leave is that what you're saying I, I, actually, I actually might to be quite honest you know because anytime you have two people in these kind of movies okay, they're always so the ones that are like with troy they're, they're dragging <laughs> it they're dragging it down you know, they, they argue with you about what's the best plan. 
They argue with you about what's you know how you should kill a zombie, how you should so kill a demon. Murder those that disagree with you. I exactly. understand where you're coming from. Okay. Yeah. This, this is a this is the very 2023 mindset. Remind me, <laughs> remind me to apologize to Troy later for nothing, just to make sure I clear the air. <laughs> well, the question was, how do you survive? Now, how does the group survive? So I was That's just true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, murder the group. That helps. Yeah, yeah. murder the, murder the group. You know, the, leave them behind. They can feast on you know the dead bodies and then you know, just take off. But um, no, I mean, I definitely don't think playing a lot of games where you like quake or doom or one of those like multiplayer shooter kind of things, squatting never does you any good. So you definitely do not go in the cellar. You definitely do not hide in a closet. You definitely do not go hide in the shed. You go to the shed, get whatever supplies you need, and then use the woods to your advantage in order to escape most likely climbing a tree because it's not bears that are attacking you. So you could climb a tree. Troy's getting tree raped. Yep. 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 The branches are coming for you. See, yeah, see, I worked that in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, you're up. Troy's murdering his friends. All right. So if one of my friends, what am I talking about? When one of my friends read from the books, <laughs> uh, and, and you're the friend, what are you talking about? You are the friend. <laughs> totally would. <laughs> and you well, you totally shit. do it just like ash and just <laughs> forget the words right. and read it out of sequence. right uh, i would start ad-libbing halfway through the sentences and everything as we go along like i do right now um so when one of my friends reads from the book uh i am just going to homer simpson my way into the cellar and then lock it up uh, as best as I can from down in the cellar and grabbing any pieces of heavy implements that I could use to uh, beat the crap out of whatever tries to come into the cellar. I am down there by myself. I don't need anyone with me. I don't care. I am just going to make it till sunrise because there's no way I'm going to go to the woods when it's no sun. There's no way I'm going to go into the, the shed filled with implements that will kill me because the first thing that's going to happen, I'm going to be like, oh, I feel safe and I have all these weapons by me. Oh, why is it floating all of a sudden? So uh, that's why I'm going to go for the cellar because there, I, I know where everything's coming from when I'm in the cellar. Isn't that where they got possessed immediately in the first movie? That was because the book was down there. So if the, if the book is down there, I will go for something else. But it, I, you said I had the option okay. of going hey, into the you cellar. Can do whatever you want. You can do whatever. Right. Yeah. The yeah, cellar yeah. has a dirt floor, and they're going to come up from the underground. Just letting you know. I I can see them coming. That's not not like they're going to surprise me. They're going to be like, sure hope no, you look, the, the earth is moving. I should just I don't know stab into it with a this chair leg or something. I don't know. It sounds a lot like that Game of Thrones plan when they all <laughs> in the basement when the dead were coming. And then all the people, and they were in the crypt, and all the bodies started coming out of the crypt. Yeah, sounds like that plan. Just a little. Well, nobody told me there were bodies in the basement. No, well, there's not bodies in the basement. They're just we, traveling underground and then coming up. Okay, I was going bodies. Okay, in the so basement. if something was a bugs going bunny, bodies in the basement. I'm not going with the Looney Tunes platform. Yeah, I was going to say if something's going to bugs bunny its way to me, it could probably have me. <laughs> That's cheating, Evil Dead. Uh, so my plan, I take my bestie with me. Right, I take him with. And then I push them down at the first sign of those demon winds chasing me so that they get the possession. They're possessed. Now, basically, I just have to stay away from them. I have to be clear of them because they're going to hold that possession until daylight. So it's like the old adage. If you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your friend. It's kind of like that. Then you find the shed. You grab a chainsaw, lock things up tight. I get a couple of axes and I duct tape them together into a cross. So I got a little, you know, I got a little of that action. And then I just get ready for a reckoning. I'm ready to go. That's it. That's my plan. That's how I survive. But I don't okay. murder my friend straight up because this evidence will be held against you in a court of law. I'm pretty sure. There's no evidence. <laughs> There's no bodies left. The <laughs> demons possess them. I meant this recording. So if this happens and I go camping with you, I'm just letting everybody know, replay this episode where he said he killed his friend. <laughs> right. He's sacrificing. He's got priorities. I can't help He's it. If, priority. You if you don't know how to pedal a canoe and you tip over, that's your own problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least my answer wasn't, uh, oh, Troy just read from the book? Stab, stab, stab. <laughs> Amanda? Well, for me, I am definitely not going into a cellar, but I am going to go to the shed and like stock up on tools and weapons, and then I'm going to take them back to the closet because in my mind, 
the closet is not on the main or first floor. It's on like a second floor closet, right? Sure. And so that's where me and my bestie, because I'm not going to just let my friend die or kill them unless <laughs> the z- <laughs> this is coming for me. And if the dead is coming for me, if the zombies are coming for me, then there may be a sacrifice. But at least then, by that point, I'll have had a friend to help me murder a bunch of them, right? Sure. So sure. I think it's a pretty good plan. I think it's this, excellent. This is where you let your creative juices flow. So the reason why you need your bestie in the closet is because you play seven minutes in heaven and that gives you superpowers Hell to wipe everybody yeah. out. Or just because it's fun. Good way to pass those minutes, right? This is this is weird. Okay, gonna, so the next one. Die anyway. Where, also, why, at why least my butthole's gonna be okay. Yeah, why, like, why does Troy have to get pervy? I don't know. Why does it always that. sound worse when Troy starts saying things like that? Why? I don't know. Because you have an image in your head, John. I hope it's not an image of me, but pair it probably is. <laughs> well, I hope it's not reversed because, you know, John, in his mind, he just murders you. Apparently, while you're stab, playing seven stab, minutes. Stab, 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 stab. <laughs> With a box of flies. Uh, okay. So a second scenario. Your hand has been possessed and you either have to cut it off to survive or surely become infected by the evil dead. But if you choose to cut your hand off, you can add any power tool to your wrist to create a weapon to fight the demons off. How do you survive, Troy? Well, I'm trying to remember, like, now that I'm thinking about Evil Dead, and now I was thinking, after reading this, Idle Hands, like, wasn't there a rule in Idle Hands that you couldn't cut your hand off in that movie? Well, we're talking the Evil Dead, so it doesn't really matter what happened there. I'm just, I'm just, you know. Well, it's the same rule, and it's the same exact rule in Army of Darkness, uh, not Army of Darkness, but Evil Dead, when he lops his hand off, his hand starts moving around and doing shit. Right. So, I'm trying to decide if I actually want to cut my hand off or not. You get possessed if you don't. Your call. You being possessed is better. The world's kind of shit right now. <laughs> okay. Your call. I guess this goes back. So this goes back to the spiritual metaphysical conversation earlier, because I believe that when we die, like the physical form goes away, but we still exist as entities. So even if I'm possessed, I still survive. Therefore, it would be fine to just leave it alone. You just are you, so you're saying you just get evicted from your own body while something else pilots it around. Exactly. Evicted. I love that. <laughs> you ain't been paying rent. You better go somewhere else. Why Time go, to move out. Why go through all the work? I mean, running around, sweating, you know, little jockish going on. Like it just. <laughs> I'm good. Take over. I'm good because I'm moving on somewhere else. Because I will survive still. I will, will survive. survive. Okay, uh, John. What do you do? Yeah, so it's it's some some almost the same answer as Troy, but better because if I can't have both my hands, life isn't worth living. Hmm. Because you're an artist. No, because I need both my hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. John know. said I like to eat I, and I like to double fist. I don't know. I don't want to know. There's so many questions I want to ask, but I don't want to know the answers. To <laughs> no, I did not go down that route for a very good reason. Nope. Okay, nope. So, oh, hey, so, if so, there's any any young ladies who happen to listen to this podcast and they want to go on a cruise, stop. I got a spare. <laughs> uh, and he's still got two hands right now, ladies. More Get them while you can. More importantly, John is a master nunchuck user. That's really what it's all about. He's going to have a stalker like- that joins this cruise <laughs> I hope shows so. up in his room. I hope so. It's going to be Troy. <laughs> Troy, why are you in my room again? <laughs> <laughs> to murder you, just in case the demons are here. Uh, I would cut my hand off. I would tie it tight. I would burn the end. I never understand why they don't do something to cauterize the wound, but whatever. And then I attach a nail gun. Not a chainsaw. I don't understand the chains. I get a nail gun. Those things are fast. Have you ever seen one? They're, they're fast. You get multiple hits. It's way worse than a chainsaw. It's more painful to watch. It's more painful to have hit you. Let's go. I'm in. That's how you do it. Except that you have the problem with the nail gun. You have the recoil effect. And then I got nothing. It, I got hey, nothing but badass nail gun. He's not going to feel anything. He just had to like sever his it's arm off. my hand off. My hand's chasing me around the room and I got a nail gun to stick it on the wall. At his age, that recoil is going to pop a shoulder and then he's never going to be able to use at the nail gun. At his age. <laughs> Guess who's getting the nails first? Okay. Amanda, what do you got? Wow. You're already dead. (laughs) 
I am cutting my hand off or hopefully having someone else do it for me because I'm too much of a little bitch for that. You did miss. Oh, shit, my <laughs> elbow. <laughs> I went too far. I went too far. Uh, but then I would attach a jackhammer. Okay. Jesus, <laughs> that's, that's, that's Jesus how much do you bench? God. Jesus. <laughs> they have handheld ones. They have like these. I'm sorry, Rock. I didn't know you were going <laughs> to. The, wait, is this the fistinator from Top Secret? <laughs> <laughs> they have like. Single handheld ones available now. I Googled it. <laughs> That's a big jackhammer still, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So what do you do when you ch- chase evil dead around pounding the ground? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more about when I get close to them, because you know how you want to get them in the head, right? Like for most things you yeah, want to try. I hope it up very tall with a jackhammer coming at them. <laughs> oh, well, I have reach. I get not the just Webster double Dead-ites. hits. I get wow. triple hits, quadruple hits. I just got to put mm-hmm, that thing mm-hmm. close enough to their skull and it just. And honestly, like all my problems I, are I solved. I can close my eyes and just hear something completely different right now. And I can I could bury them with that, too, because that'll start like digging mm, up the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Put them right back where they were at. <laughs> mm-hmm, you're mm-hmm. assuming that these things are corporeal all the time. They're demons. All you're doing is decimating the thing that they're possessing currently they're still going to get you doing is damaging the house at this point <laughs> like you're killing the resale value because people are going to show up the next day oh you lived what happened to this house uh there's all these dead things and uh, okay did you have to destroy the house though because we loaned you to this cabin for the weekend i mean you're not getting your deposit back that's all i'm saying that's fine i have yeah, a jackhammer the, for an arm this is the worst airbnb i've ever had <laughs> Well, if they have, if listen, if they have little demons coming after me, I'm going to, they're the ones who are not going to get money. I'm getting my deposit back. You guys now owe me money because I had to save everyone's life. I'm a hero. (laughs) I am an American hero for you. You're welcome. Amanda, all I know is your arms are going to be huge. I'm going to be jacked. You're going to be jacked. <laughs> Just one arm, though. <laughs> the left arm is going to be struggling. Horrible joke. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Uh, just so you know, we would all die. Remember the next time you head to a theater or stream comfortably from your couch, buy popcorn and be sure to come back next week for the PETA interview. Take care.